I kind of lost my hair a little bit, you know, right? It's kind of, but I, I still carry a comb around with me. I just can't part with it. Uh, so listen, that joke is Savannah's fault this morning because I didn't have one. And she's like, well, come on, we look forward to the joke. And I'm like, all right, here we go. That's as good as I can come up with on short notice. So. Listen, I am, you don't understand how overwhelmed I am this morning from the words that came forward. Kevin started off this morning with his prayer, and I almost had to tap him around the ankles because he started on my teaching. And then the ladies came up and gave some words that went along right with the teaching. And it's not by mistake that God orchestrates this day. And when that happens, I get so overwhelmed because I'm like, the Lord wants us to hear this message this morning. He wants us to hear it. Whether we want to hear it or not sometimes, He wants us to hear this message. And so, um, you know, recently I've been, we've been spending some time in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John uh, in our daily Bible reading calendar. And, you know, not to be confused with the Gospel of John, 1st John is a, is a different epistle. Written by the same man, the Apostle John, but um, a different focus on it, a different letter, a different um, theme in it. So today I'm going to be focusing on 1 John. And John wrote these letters to encourage the new believers of Christ. And uh, he was really trying to reassure them that what they heard about Christ was true. Now, we spoke a few weeks ago about the uncertainty that new believers were having with their faith and the things that they were believing. So this letter, again, is another, um, another confirmation to them that what they've been hearing is true. It's not a myth. It's not a lie. And it really kind of echoes some of the same sentiments as uh, the, the books of Peter in his letters. And much like Peter, John also warned the early church that there would be those around them who will try to deceive them and spread lies about Christ. And he just keeps reiterating this. And it was interesting. I was in, the, in, the, in some earlier books, and it just, just seems to be a really common theme uh, among, these, uh, among these epistles that there's going to be theirs who are th those there who are trying to dissuade you, those there who are trying to pull you away from your faith in Christ and from your belief in Christ. But he also tells them that, listen, people are going to come against you, but it should be no surprise. You shouldn't be surprised. I mean, maybe they thought that now that they accepted Christ that, you know, hey, things are going to be different now. People aren't going to come up to me or get in my face. You know, you would think that as a Christian, people would not come up and challenge you, but that seems to be a very common theme that we go through in 2023. As much as it was back then, there are those there who are out there who is only, I don't want to say only, um, one of their goals is to dissuade you from your faith. And he wakes them up to the fact that, listen, there's going to be people out there who don't like you. And the collective gas went, oh, how could somebody not like me? Right? <laughs> There are those out there who don't want you to be a successful Christian. There are those who are out there who don't want you to continue in their faith. It's very similar to the world that we live in today. And there are those out there whose only mission in life is just to discredit Christianity. That's their main goal in life. I'm not sure why they care what they believe, but there are some that do. And I believe that 1 John actually makes this point even clearer. And if you put up there 1 John 3.13, it says this, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We heard about that word hate this morning, and I was like, wait a minute, here we go again. Thank you, Lord, for another confirmation. Don't be surprised, people, when others hate you. You'll, you'll go on the internet or Facebook or whatever, and you'll see these reels and these memes of you know, people who are just angry at Christians. 
for spreading the gospel. And don't be surprised about that. Let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you this personally. Do you think there are people in the world who hate you just because you're a Christian? I think everybody kind of like shaking their head. Yeah, there are those out there. And I would absolutely agree with you. Some people hate based upon the difference that is between them and you. I think that's kind of the classic definition of racism. Really hating somebody because they're different than you. Picking out and discriminating against others because of the differences that may be in their appearance or their thoughts or their ideals or their morals. And the problem is that we as human beings have this certain need. We want to be liked. Most of us do. Some of us go, I could really care less. Some of us are like, that's very important to me. And we all want to be liked by others and sometimes can't understand why someone wouldn't. Why wouldn't somebody like me? What is it about me that somebody doesn't like? And I've actually even seen people change who they are to appease others. I think it happens a lot in public social situations. Probably happens a lot in school, right? Where you have these people, you have peers on your side and you have a different thought they do and they kind of look at you like, how could you think like that? And then you begin to question, well, how could I think like that? Well, maybe I should think like this. Because if I think like this, then nobody's going to give me a hard time. People are going to like me. Now, listen, if you're a bad person and you change to appease others, that's probably a pretty good thing. However, if you are a good, godly person and you're modifying yourself to please ungodly people, it's going to be harmful to you. It's going to take you down the wrong road. Verse 13 says, don't marvel. For all those of you who are under 20, you're thinking Marvel, you're thinking superheroes. Anne's over there laughing because that, she's thinking of Thor and his big hammer, right? And all that stuff. <laughs> but do not marvel. In other words, don't spend too much time thinking or contemplating about why the world hates you. John actually says, it's actually pretty darn simple. What's simple about it? 1 John 3, in verse 1, it says this, Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. That's the reason why people hate you, because they did not know Him. You're trying to imitate Christ as a Christian. You're trying to replicate Him, you're trying to emulate the things that He did, you're trying to speak the way He did, and if we act like Tim, chances are that they're not going to understand or accept us because they didn't understand or accept Him. It's really kind of simple. If you're living your most Christian life, a lot of the world is not going to like you. If you're living your least Christian life, well then maybe you have some more friends. Because they don't understand the way you're acting. They don't understand why you're talking the way you're talking. That's what they don't like about you. It's the Jesus inside of you. I guarantee if you acted more like them, they would love you. If you're out hanging out the bars with them till the wee hours of the morning and telling coarse jokes and cheating on your spouse and all that, chances are you probably have a few more friends if that's the life that you wanted to live. But when you're trying to be a better person, sometimes those things that are highlighted in you highlight their own flaws and their own shortcomings. The more of a brighter Christian that you are, the more they realize how much different they are from you. And that grates on people sometimes. Most people don't like to be exposed for who they are. That's why people do things in the secret 
in the dark, in the quiet. If somebody's cheating on their wife, they don't normally go out to a public place and say, hey, look who I'm with. They do it in the secret. They do it in the quiet because they don't want anybody to know about it. It makes them feel uncomfortable. So when others come at you with hate, what does John say you should do? Let's find out. Hit them with love over and over and over and over and over again. It's not always an easy thing to do. 1 John 3.11 says this, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Thank you, Kevin, for bringing that forward this morning. You've heard this from the beginning. This is not a new message. This is not a light, hopefully it's not a light bulb moment to you. All of us in this room, I think, have been around for quite a few years. It should not be really a surprise to us that we should love one another. However, John goes even further saying that possessing and showing love is evidence that one is actually a Christian. So what's the opposite? If you don't show love, is that evidence that you're not a Christian? I'm just bringing up a question that's for you to decide and think about. 1 John 2.10 says this, He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Again, the opposite of that, conversely, lack of love is an indication that one is in darkness. You're like, man, well, that's hard to love people sometimes. I understand that. Kathy gave us a word about, or Paul, I forget who it was, but talked about what was in our heart is what gets shown out. 1 John 2.9 says this, he who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness till now. Darkness. He even says that there's another scripture that says he who does not love or hates his brother but thinks he's in the light lies to himself. <clears throat> So there's similarly, there's verses in John 3 and John 4 that both say that he who does not love is not of God. Wow. Listen, I know this is a strong word. I'm not going to tone it down, though, because this is the word of the Lord. This is the word of God for now. We've already been kind of getting peppered with it this morning already. And I think this is the culmination of what God is trying to show us. He who does not love is not of God. The two can't mix together. I want you to think of that and remember that the next time that unrighteous anger or that hate rises up inside of you. Is this really, am I really of God? If I am, why is this rising up in me so? Why am I feeling like this? I'm not saying there's not a way out of it. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The Lord is there to forgive. The Lord is there to guide. There may even be some who are listening to my voice and say, Pastor, you have no idea what that person did to me. You have no idea. I have every right to hate them for what they did to me. Aggravated? Okay. Upset? I understand. Hate? Nope. There's no room for hate in the Christian vocabulary, in the Christian life. 
Now, how can John say this? After some of the, listen, some of us have gone through some pretty horrific things. And I am not downplaying that at all. But John reminds us of this because of Christ's love for us. In 1 John 3.16, I love the 3.16s in the Bible. They're all pretty good. It says, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We know what true love is. Each of us, when we became a Christian, found out what true love was all about. It was about our Savior laying down his life for us. We have been given that example. We all got to experience that love that Jesus showed to each and every one of us. When he laid down his life for us, it was the most perfect and pure love that could ever be given to anyone. Perfect and pure. No bad heart motivations. Perfect and pure. And we all have personal knowledge of this firsthand because we each had sin in our lives that was pretty evident before we came to Christ. And he laid down his life for us anyway. There's your example of what true love is. There's your example that love can conquer all. Jesus loved us in spite of ourselves. He loved us anyway. He did everything he did while we were still sinners. That's the example that we need to bring forth from here. Verse 16 goes on and says, And because he laid down his life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, Pastor, you had me up until there, but I don't know about that one. I'll be a nice guy. I'll smile. If they need something, I'll give them a hand. But laying down my life for a brother? I don't know, Pastor. We have had that example in our lives. And so John calls us to lay down our lives for our brother. When I read this verse, it kind of reminded me of a couple different things. The first thing that he reminded me of is that Christ was the example of love. And his love for us is great. Therefore, our love for others must be great also. It must be the same. It must replicate. It must duplicate. Love should not be casual or an afterthought. But love must be intense and severe. These are my words here. These aren't John's. But this is how I'm thinking about it. Do you think Christ had to have intense love for you to lay down his life on the cross? I would be sitting there. We heard about the word about uh, the gnats and the camels this morning. How we think our sins are gnats and how we think other people's are camels. Can you imagine Christ looking at me before he died in the state that I was in and said, I'm laying down my life for that guy. I would have been, had my hands on my head going, i got to lay down my life for this guy? Are you kidding me, Father? Do you see what a mess he is? And Father God said, yep, I see what a mess he is. And I love him anyway. Love must be intense, purposeful, severe, thoughtful, not an accident. So how does John say that we're supposed to love others? Let's look at 1 John 3.17, the verse after this, and it says, But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him. 
Now, I won't make you raise your hand, but I'm going to ask a question. Who here has the world's goods? I know I do. The Lord has blessed me. He's blessed me monetarily. He's blessed me spiritually. He's blessed me in many different ways in my life. And if I see a brother in need and I say, nope, how does the love of God abide in me? That word, and shuts up in his heart here, it, translate, it translates into this, and does not have compassion on him. Now listen, there's a lot of people in this world who are in need. Some by their own doings, some not by their own doings. And obviously you have to be led by Christ in those people that you reach out to because some people will do the wrong thing. But we're not, we're not talking about the actual physical giving of money and food. We're talking about the heart that comes behind that. We're talking about the heart motivation and the heart attitude towards somebody else, to a brother in need. If we're honest with ourselves, we have all been blessed by God abundantly. Even if you don't have a lot, you've still been blessed abundantly. Even the least of us in this room could probably scrape together a meal for somebody who God called them to, right? Maybe we had to not go to Starbucks for a couple days to be able to do that afterwards. But I think most of us could honestly say, yeah, I could scrape together a meal for somebody who God called me to do that to, to help a neighbor in need. The highlight of the scripture is it goes beyond the physical abundance. It's about the heart attitude, and that's about having compassion and sharing love with others. And that's what I kind of want you to get out of this. The second half of next, the next verse, verse 18, continues on and says, and let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed and truth. There's a scripture, and I believe it's either Psalms or Proverbs. It says, and we send them away, go well and be good, you know, rather than helping them or, or sharing with them. Words are real easy to say. I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you, sister. What they need is a ride to the doctor's office. They don't need your prayer at that moment. Words are easy to say, but putting actions into those words is a little bit harder. Putting effort and time into someone's life is a much better example of love than go and be well, I'll pray for you. Listen, I understand sometimes that's what it has to be. But I also understand that there's times where you're like, listen, I get a car 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour, an hour, two hours for my neighbor in need to show them God's love. But that's what John asks and calls us to do. Put your money where your mouth is, Leback. Sir. You say you're a Christian with your mouth, do your actions prove that? Do your actions prove, do they back up your mouth? Or is your mouth writing checks that you're not cashing? And if you're backing up those words with actions, then follow it up with whatever is necessary, whatever Christ calls you to do. Lastly, I'd like to end with a scripture from 1 John, and it's in chapter 4, and verse 10. It says this, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the... Yeah, I can say that right now. Thank you. Propitiation for our sins. And when I read this scripture... Something kind of clicked in my brain. It says, not that we love God, but that He loved us. And I want to add 
a word to the end of us. Not that we love God, but that he loved us first. We know that the Bible says that God loved us while we were still in the womb, while we were still sinners. He loved us before we knew anything about him. He loved us before we ever loved him or accepted him into our heart. To me, this is another great example of how we're supposed to love our neighbors. We're supposed to love them first before they show any love to us, before they show any kindness to us. We're supposed to love them first. Sometimes we wait for other people to reciprocate and show us love or kindness before we give it to them. I would ask you a question. Is that real love? Or is that just being nice to somebody who's being nice to you? That's easy. It's a lot harder to share that love when somebody's telling you you're no good, dirty, blah 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 blah. <laughs> Did Christ wait to show us love until we first showed him love? Nope. He showed us love first. If you want to shoot, if you, I'm sorry, if you want wait to show love and compassion to those who come against you, guess what? You're going to be waiting a long time. Don't hold your breath because you'll be passed out on the floor. They're not called to love you first. You are. We can't wait for others to make the first move and then reciprocate with love. If you refuse to show love and compassion to those you don't like, the scripture asks, is Christ really in you? Is God really in you? Is love really in you? And that's not something we mentally say in our minds, usually. It's not something we usually say out loud, usually. Sometimes we do. But it's something that we think, and it's something that we contemplate. Well, you know what? They're just being mean to them, so I'm not showing them nothing. That's what's coming out of your heart. That's what you've stored up in there for that to come out. 1 John 4 reminds us that many will see God through the love and kindness we show. I'm going to repeat that one more time because somebody needs to hear that. Many will see God through the love and the kindness that we show. Many will come to know the salvation of Jesus Christ in the love that we show them. Many will receive healing and freedom from the love and the kindness that we show. The more love we show, the more kindness we show, the more compassion we show, the more people will get the connection between that and Christ. The more we act like Him, the more people will want to know Him. Wow, this is the nicest person I have ever met in my life. Why? What do they have that I don't have? What's going on in them that I would love to be able to be this happy? Love to be able to show this much kindness. Love to be able to show this much love. It's such a critical part of the Christian message and it's something that we always need to remember. Listen, I'm going to end with this. When things rise up inside of you, when that dislike, when that hate, when that anger rises up inside of you, you need to say, Lord, I am sorry. Please forgive me for my thoughts. Please forgive me for my actions. Please forgive me for the words that I've spoken and those thoughts that I've meditated on. And Lord, I need your help to get through this. Because I know what I'm supposed to do. 
I know the love that I'm supposed to share. I know the kindness and compassion that I'm supposed to reach out and give to my neighbor. I pray that you would remind yourself of these things on a daily basis. And let your love be purposeful. Let your love be thoughtful. Let your love be um, specific and not just an accident in your daily life. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this word and I thank you for orchestrating this day. I do not believe it's an accident that you've called us to, to share this word today, to remind each other. And Father God, I pray that we do not forget these words that we've learned today and that love becomes so purposeful in our life that it is second nature and it is habit, Father God, rather than negative thoughts that come to our mind. And Lord, I pray that as we show love, that people will receive that love, Father God, and want to know more about you. And you will give us the opportunity to share more about you. I pray these things in Jesus' name.